Uh, welcome to this uh, session uh, organized by the Arctic Mayors Forum. My name is Ásthildur Sturludóttir and I'm the mayor of Akureyri municipality here in, in Iceland. And I'm also the chairman of Arctic Mayors Forum. Uh, we have here today three prominent speakers. We were supposed to be four, but unfortunately one got, caught a flu. So she's not with us, uh, with us today. That is Mirja Vekapera, the political mayor of Oulu city in Finland. But we will send her our best regards. As everyone has noticed, we've had uh, some problems during the last two years. And uh, due to COVID-19, the pandemic. And we would like to discuss today how, we, we have, how the cities have dealt with the pandemic. And uh, first of all, I would like to, to uh, uh, ask uh, Jakko Simonen, the associate professor at Oulu Business School at the University of Oulu and member of the Arctic Five Collaboration to come up and speak. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and, and good afternoon, everyone. During these days here in Reykjavik, we have had a chance to hear interesting presentation on how climate change has changed or will change people's life and regional development and affect regional development in, our, in the Arctic regions. Question is about the long-term change to which we are well prepared or at least should be prepared. We know a lot of uh, a lot about these changes, what they will cause, and what they require at the individual, organizational, and regional levels. Question is about the resilience, our capability to adapt to this change. Last one and a half years, as we just heard, has shown that we must be prepared to other types of changes, unexpected shocks as well. We have seen that uh, that global crises, current COVID-19 type of shocks, may have a strong and rapid impact on our lives and regional development, not least from the economic point of view. In this presentation, I will focus on so-called Arctic Five cities. What is the Arctic Five collaboration? The Arctic Five is a forum for collaboration of five multidisciplinary internationally recognized universities in northern Finland, Sweden, and Norway, but also of the respective uh, cities, which are in many ways engines of growth in the Arctic Scandinavia. Before we go to the topic itself, uh, I would like to introduce our research group, where we have economists from four Arctic Five universities representing regional economic expertise from all three countries, especially in northern part of these countries. Uh, without going too deep into academic research, a few general thoughts on how academic literature defines resilience. The concept of resilience describes how well actors, whether they are people, firms, or other type of organizations, as well as regions, are able to adapt unexpected changes in the economic and technological environment. When we think about the current 19 pandemic, a sudden global level shock from the economic point of view, it's probably too much to say that some regions were able to anticipate this kind of crisis. But we can ask where there some, where are some regions more prepared to deal with the shock of COVID-19? I think yes, uh, how can we say that? Regional resilience means how well region is able to respond to and recover from external shock. But it's more than that. Equally important is the ability of regions to anticipate and repair for disturbances. Furthermore, shocks also can provide a chance for re reorientation too. Regional resilience is highly dependent on resources of regions and interaction between local actors. What regions have learned from previous crises also plays an important role. 
However, we may say, well say that regional resilience is significantly based on the resilience of people. So how has the pandemic changed people's behavior? The restrictions which government has set up to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic has, have affected how people spend their free time and how much time they spend at home, for example. In these figures, blue curves show how the time which people spend at home has developed compared with the baseline, which is median day value in January 2020, just before pandemic. Red curves in turn show how COVID-19 cases have developed at the same time. In the beginning of the pandemic, around week, weeks 10 to 20 in 2020, uh, how was spent at home increased significantly. I thought the number of COVID-19 cases were low. During the summer 2020, hours spent at home dropped in all cities. Number of COVID-19 cases were still low. In autumn 2020, the number of COVID-19 cases increased in almost all cities. We see that at the same time, blue curves rise too, which means people spend more time at home. From March of this year, blue graphs look pretty similar in all cities. People have spent less time at home. I thought we have seen some COVID cases. Strong similarities between cities, I mean, how much time people have spent at home through the whole pandemic is interesting. Figures show that different lock-in strategies between countries had impacts, but not as large as one may expect. Anyway, the fact that people spend more time at home means, of course, that they spend less time somewhere else. This figure shows how the number of visits to places categorized as retail and recreation has, have changed. We see that the long-term pattern of visits is quite similar in all cities. At the beginning of the pandemic, the number of visits fell sharply. After the rise towards the baseline in summer 2020, the number of visits fe again fell towards the end of the year, peaking just before Christmas 2020. In this year, the development has been upwards towards the baseline, and some cities already passed it. This is, of course, just one example how the pandemic has affected local economies. This figure here shows what kind of impact the pandemic has had on the lab local labor markets. The private sector, which has long been responsible for employment growth, especially in large cities, has suffered the most. We can see that the introduction of rest rest restriction measures in March 2020 contributed to almost explosive growth in number of en en unemployed people in many cities. However, already during April 2020, many companies began to call back labor workers. And the number of employed, unemployed people declined remarkably through the whole uh, spring and summer 2020. This same development has continued. Now in October 2021, we have almost reached the pre-COVID level of unemployment also in Finland. These figures show that the recovery of these cities has actually happened remarkably quickly. This figure supports this conclusion. In April 2021, the number of new open vacancies we are already above pre-COVID-19 level in all Arctic five cities. Therefore, I thought the labor market is strongly affected by the pandemic. The demand for labor is well maintained in all cities. This figure shows also another important thing when we are thinking about the future of these cities and regions. Large industrial investments in Northern Finland and Sweden and Norway have increased increase the demand for skilled labor force. It is easy to predict that this demand will increase in forthcoming years. In the beginning of this presentation, I ask a question. Were some regions more prepared to deal with the COVID-19 shock? Are there more expertise in dealing with the shocks and crisis in some regions? 
I think yes. We can take a city of Oulu as an example. Oulu is a textbook example how the effects of shock can be alleviated through effective regional policy. The important features of regional resilience can be combined with a framework which we call as creative resilience. Successful resilience requires actions at the level of workers, firms, and regional authorities. Regional is highly based on the interaction of various actors. Three elements, knowledge creation, entrepreneurship, and community spirit form the core of creative resilience. We need creativity and willingness to take risks. Megatrends affect regional development also in, in the Scandinavian Arctic regions. They cause challenges and threats as well as opportunities. Broad and systematic cross-border cooperation in various fields of business and innovation could significantly reinforce region's ability to tackle these issues. It will increase the resilience of these regions, but also promote their regional sustainable growth. We need creative actions and forward-looking attitude. We have seen that effects of shocks can be alleviated through effective regional policy. However, as I already said, in the end, regional resilience is significantly based on the resilience of people. Thank you. Thank you, Jarko. The uh, Arctic resilience doesn't surprise me. Uh, one of the cities, uh, the, the Arctic five cities, is Luleå. And I would like to ask Anders Josefsson, the deputy mayor of the city of Luleå in Sweden, to take the floor. Thank you so much, and excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked to say a few words about the impact of COVID-19 on the city of Luleå and also the Arctic parts of Sweden. Well, we'll start by saying it feels a bit strange standing by the podium at the conference after a year and a half on Zoom and Teams and Skype and such, so I'll try to manage. Anyways, the pan pandemic has shown how vulnerable, vulnerable our society is, but it has also shown the importance of learning from these times to build sustainable, resilient, green, and inclusive cities in the Arctic. As for Luleå, and as in many other places, the tourism industry is our most affected sector, down 30% from 2019 to 2020. And much of the workforce, they have moved on. There's a gap of qualified personnel, and once the economy recover in these vital industries, there, there is a lack of workforce, yet we know that the, these kinds of jobs are very important for integration of young and new citizens. As for other areas, the city of Luleå has been acting to support and strengthen both the business community and the civil society for str stronger public health and social sustainability and to minimize the risk of vulnerability and social anxiety. For example, we established a digital business support for local companies. We also introduced a rental discount for companies and organizations in properties owned by the city. We also created an e-service to facilitate access to our city's direct procurements. And we closely collaborated <coughs> with the civil society, among others the Red Cross, where volunteers helped the risk groups to buy food, medicine, and therefore minimize their exposure to the disease. We have also seen an increased interest toward digital solutions, as many others, I'm sure, we are very positive to continue working at a distance even after the pandemic is over and done with, with the ambition to be an attractive employer. Competition for labor is one reason why there is a need to place greater emphasis on performance and results instead of the physical presence at a specific workplace. And that is something I think all we in the sparsely populated Arctic with its long distances can learn from and benefit. But finally, one of the greatest challenges for us have been the closed borders. As you may know, the Norrbotten region where Luleå is situated is a border region. We have land borders to both Norway and Finland. And part of the workforce live in one side of the border and work in another country. And supplies often have to transverse the borders to reach the, uh, the customer. <clears throat> 
Therefore, the closed borders, they greatly stressed all of our regions in all three countries. And here, I definitely see a role for the Arctic communities to speak to and influence the national level to, if possible, make special allowances for our sparsely populated, very interconnected regions. And I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anders. Uh, we, the uh, mayors of the small uh, uh, communities, uh, have all uh, uh, a similar story to tell. And uh, I know some of the things that you, you were mentioning. Thank you, Anders. But last, and last but, but not the least is, uh, <laughs> is Jennifer Spence, the Executive Secretary at, uh, of the Arctic Council Sustainable Development Working Group. The floor is yours. I have to say this. I've been telling people uh, all the time that I'm the last speaker of the last session in the last plenary. So thank you all for staying to listen to us. Um, but I do think it's an incredibly important topic and I, I really think I'm, I'm glad that I could be here with the Arctic Mayors Forum to discuss this. I think that the role of cities in the work that we all do it cannot be underestimated. Uh, they are leaders and they are innovators. We've seen that in things like climate change, social programs and infrastructure. And here is a perfect example with COVID-19 of the critical role that municipalities and cities play. Um, and we need to really consider what that means both in the short term and the long term. I also want to acknowledge the Arctic Mayors Forum. Um, I think that it's a very new organization, but they've recognized the need to share experiences, to share best practices, and what better place to start and, and really bring this together than in an environment like with COVID-19, where there's some really critical lessons to be learned and some experiences to share. So I really look forward to continuing to work with the Arctic Mayors Forum because I think they are going to be key players as we move forward. They're a platform uh, that really can sort of allow us as partners to really tap into the experiences and expertise of this particular level of government. Um, I also think it's important to recognize that the Arctic Council has recognized that COVID-19 is an important issue um, that really is something that needs to be a focus uh, and dem has demonstrated the flexibility to continue to do work in this area. Um, the senior Arctic officials and then the ministers in the spring were very clear that this is something that they will put attention to and that they recognize that supporting the region through this is incredibly important. In that vein, the Sustainable Development Working Group has already established two projects that are particularly related to COVID-19, one specifically on Arctic community perspectives on COVID-19 and public health, which is currently underway, and another on biosecurity in the Arctic. And a last project that's currently being proposed and considered by uh, the, the heads of delegation of the Sustainable Development Working Group, which would be an assessment report of various work being done on COVID-19 in the area. And for those of you who've stuck around because you're particularly interested in this topic, if it's something that you're doing research on, this is really meant to be a mechanism to share the research and experiences of those of you who are doing work in this area. So I encourage you uh, to come forward and, and share with us um, your experiences and, and your knowledge and your lessons learned. I think that it's really important to emphasize that as we talk about the end, and we're all here, which demonstrates that COVID-19 is not necessarily, you know, going to be the end all and be all. We will have a world where we can come back together, but the work is not done. And it's going to require collaboration. It's going to require collaboration with on the ground implementers like cities, but it's gonna require a regional cooperation. It's gonna require national cooperation. And it's really to recognize that this isn't just a human health issue. This is about economies. This is about social programs. This is about cultures and societies. And we really need to take the long view in terms of learning from this experience, both in terms of responding to COVID-19 specifically, but presumably other shocks uh, that we may have in the future and what can we learn from this experience and how can we implement new things that really sort of recognize what we've learned from this. 
My last message, um, before hopefully we can have a little discussion before we all run away, um, is I've said this is, you know, this is also a, a time of resilience and innovation. And I, as much as it's sort of an awkward thing to say, say I think it's worth considering what opportunities COVID-19 offers us, what opportunities to do things differently. We don't need to go back to the status quo, as we've heard. There can be new work arrangements. There can be new social programs. There can be new approaches to green shift. We can look at what windows of opportunity have we in front of us to really think about what we can do differently. And I think if we don't take that from this, uh, then we've sort of missed the boat. So uh, with that, uh, I look forward to the conversation and thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for your kind words. Uh, I would like to stress here that uh, today and, and during these days of the uh, uh, Arctic Circle, we've had a, a dozen of mayors from all over the Arctic that have been joining uh, uh, and, uh, the, this conference. And it has been great days for us to catch up. We haven't met for, uh, in person for, for two years like everyone else. And also, I would like to, to mention that uh, during the pandemic, uh, the Arctic Mayors Forum has had uh, uh, virtual meetings a uh, few times to share knowledge and share the best practices from what we've been in, uh, doing and dealing with the pandemic in, in the cities uh, and, uh, uh, that are involved in the Arctic Mayors Forum. And it has been very important for us and we believe that collaboration is the key. And uh, we believe that we, we can learn from each other so much. We are all dealing, we have all been dealing with the same. We've been dealing with a healthcare crisis. We've been dealing with uh, the closing of schools. We've been dealing with closing of uh, play schools and, and people working from home. And also we have been dealing with a, a, a totally different work arrangements for, for all our staff. And uh, I must say that we've been doing a great job. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can say that with, with uh, uh, pretty certain that we have been doing a great job. And that is because we have an excellent workforce and we have a, a great staff of people that have been resilient. And uh, that is uh, the key in the Arctic, resilience. And uh, people have solved every problem that has come up. And we, uh, we are servicing the most delicate people uh, within every municipality, the elderly, the disabled, and of course, uh, our young citizens in the schools. So our staff has even uh, been quarantined themselves to, to uh, work with uh, disabled people and, and older people. But uh, I'm not going to have a, a monologue myself, but uh, also I would like to have a, a fruitful discussion and hopefully open the floor for questions. Uh, but I would like to ask, uh, uh, start with asking you, Anders, uh, what opportunities do you see with uh, a systemic change within the cities? What do you see in that? I think that many of the solutions that have been forced upon us by this, uh, by this time they may well be useful going forwards. For example, minimize the level of bureaucracy mm -hmm. when a city is dealing with both its inhabitants and suppliers, mm -hmm. the greater digital maturity, both at a city level and in the population. It will open up new ways of working, delivering services. Mm -hmm. I also think that we definitely need to plan and establish stockpiles of critical supplies. Mm -hmm. For example, protective medical gear. That was a shortage we lived for, with for two, three, four months, and that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And lot, lots more, but I think I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with you with uh, uh, try to minimize the bureaucracy yeah. and uh, try to use uh, digitalization to uh, give better service to the people because uh, we, are a, a, we are a service provider and uh, our key should be to service the people and, uh, very well. Uh, Jakob. You, uh, talk, uh, not only did you mention uh, the Arctic resilience that I, I really was, was uh, uh, 
I, uh, yeah, I, I really loved that. But you mentioned also a cross-border innovation cooperation. Well, what can you tell, uh, tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah, that is something what we have analyzed quite a lot and studied uh, over the past years. And, and, and I don't know how many of you is, is, is knows about this uh, uh, EU uh, regional smart specialization strategy. Mm -hmm. and, and in, of course, what it means is that regions should identify uh, the, the future growth, uh, growth areas. And, and smart means that they, they should be identify their strengths mm -hmm. and, and comparative assets. And specialization in turn means that they should prioritize uh, R&D invest, investments. And, but of course, it requires that we have a shared vision of what, what the future would be. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, it, if we think about that on the regional level, it's complicated. But if you think about that cross-border, it becomes much, much more complicated. And, mm -hmm. But I think that it could, uh, could uh, uh, not only promote the innovation activities, but also increase the resilience. And, and, and actually, our studies have shown that there's a lot of uh, possibility to take steps to, to more systematic, more integrated innovation cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I think we found that during the pandemic, uh, especially when we've been uh, talking to each other, the, the cities, uh, how we can work together. And that has been an, uh, really important for us, for us yes, all. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Jennifer, how do you think we can best take, learn from and build on the experience of the Arctic cities during the pandemic? Well, I I think that the, the important thing is that there's a continuing conversation. I mean, the fact that the Arctic Mayors Forum is, is having these meetings and having these discussions. Um, and I think then that the next question is, what do we take away from it? Where, how do we translate that sort of emergency response mm -hmm. into sort of longer term lessons learned and planning and, and not to sort of just sort of work towards the status quo. Um, I really think there's an opportunity for innovation and to, to learn from that. And, and so I really hope this can be part of an ongoing dialogue. And, and I hope that you will consider who, who your partners are, who cities can work with mm -hmm. uh, to be part of this conversation, because you, you are on the front lines. I mean, there's no other sort of way of putting it when it comes to, to managing these situations. So how can other levels of government support cities uh, to, to make this uh, a, a transition into something that we can all sort of look back on and say that we, we learned and evolved in, and, and innovated through this experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think for all of us, it was a very tough time. Yeah. Uh, it were tough uh, almost two years. And of, of course, it's still, it's still a tough, uh, it's still tough for us. But uh, uh, I think even though I like uh, we saw in your research, Jarko, that uh, uh, even though we had a high level of unemployment rate, it's going rapidly down. Yeah. Yeah. And even in many cities, we are uh, experienced that uh, we need more workforce. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can tell us that our economy is, is, uh, is straightening up pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah.